Did Joseph Smith really do a greater work than Jesus? Next on the Ex-Mormon Files. Hi, and welcome to another episode of the Ex-Mormon Files. I'm your host, Bishop Earl, and I appreciate you joining with us. I'm really excited today to, and for the next couple of episodes, to have my friend and brother in Christ, uh, Danny Larson here. Earl, it's great to be here. <laughs> nice to be here. We've done something that we kind of did once before with another guest, and that is go through some topics. Not in detail, maybe, but just the kind of topics that affected us as we were coming out of Mormonism, things we've learned since. Most people say that they've learned more after they came out Definitely. of the church than before. But we want to hit these topics, just kind of maybe pique your interest and curiosity to go look further. And, uh, but I wanted to introduce Danny in, in the sense of, um, I actually interviewed you in episode 110, I think it was. Hmm. And so just give us a couple of minutes of your biography a little sure, bit, thank you. you? <laughs> yeah, I will. Um, well, I was born in Boise, Idaho uh, to a great family. Uh, grew up there, graduated from high school and college actually from Boise State. And uh, the, well, blue, I, the blue field? The blue turf, <laughs> the Smurf turf. As I uh, was growing up, we weren't really an active family. My dad wasn't hardly active at all, but my mom felt the need to get us to church, so we went. And so oh. I went through all the different steps of primary mm. and the Sunday school priesthood, um, young men's, a little bit of young men's and that sort of thing, but didn't really care too much. In fact, I didn't have any friends, really, that were Mormon. Oh, really? Yeah. Even in Boise? Huh? I, yes, oh. I, even in high school. I didn't really even know that many Mormons. Wow. Uh, I just uh, had different interests, you know. I played a lot of sports. Yeah. and partied <laughs> and so that probably the reason why I didn't have those close Mormon friends but yeah. I went away to Rick's College on a football scholarship and while I was there I had this miraculous spiritual experience that is very sacred to me that where I God revealed himself to me yeah. in a spiritual manner such that it changed my whole direction and where I was heading and I thought it, that it had everything to do with Mormonism because I was at a Mormon school, right? Sure. A Mormon college. I wasn't even attending Mormon church at that, that time oh. going to school. Institute. Which I was supposed anything? to be going to, to, to church, yeah. you know, and taking the religion classes. Yeah. But this experience completely changed my life. And uh, I had such a strong desire to go on a mission and to share Jesus Christ with others that I had to wait for a year and go through some general authority interviews and finally got an acceptance or a, a call to go to Ireland, which I just loved that ex two year experience. Oh, wow. Had a very successful mission and uh, came home, uh, married the bishop's daughter, <laughs> uh, started in to, the temple. In the temple. Yeah. Got back to school and then was teaching early morning seminary while I was going to college and working. And during that process, uh, the church contacted me and asked me if I wanted to teach full-time for the church. Oh. And uh, so they hired me as a full-time seminary teacher. I moved here uh, and after I graduated and taught for several years before I decided I needed more income. So I <laughs> went and found a more, you know, uh, a, a better or more Paying job, higher paying, paying job. Uh, yeah, job. And then, um, so as I did that, I continued to serve faithfully in the church. You know, I, I, I sure. look at my um, my time in, in the church as uh, someone who was crossing the plains, pulling this hand, hand cart, you know, dutifully wanting to get to the promised land eventually, yeah. right? doing all the things that I was required to do and that I wanted to do. I love serving in the church. I held many positions on the stake and ward level. And, um, but I know that along the way I would toss into my cart questions and doubts that I just didn't want to look at for fear that it might um, influence the way mm. I felt about the church. And mm. so as that cart became heavy and full and I just couldn't pull it any longer without finally just stopping I, I started to, to examine each one of those questions and doubts that I had using the Bible as my true source. And as I did that, I found that I, there was no longer a need to carry those around anymore, and I just unloaded them. Eventually, my cart, my cart was completely empty. <laughs> and uh, 
I had a very strong um, regeneration of the heart, yeah. you know, and accepting Christ again into my life and realizing it had nothing to do with Mormonism. He was there all along, just guiding my path. So for 60 years I was in Mormonism and then decided I didn't need any of that any longer and decided to just follow him. Uh -huh. And you know what? His burden is light yeah. and it's joyful. And so you really felt a freedom. Oh, you? yes. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I have too. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. Well, thank you. And certainly, boy, your seminary background and teaching and all that. How long were you then? With Seven the years Seven altogether. Years teaching. Uh -huh. Wow. Well, my little biography, I think everybody knows it, and you can click on it, probably find it somewhere. But I was in the church also for many years and very faithful. I went on a mission to Denmark, married my dear wife, Carla, in the Salt Lake Temple and raised four kids, unfortunately, in now in Mormonism. Uh, but we were very faithful, always held ter temple recommends. And then for some reason, I just read this 1830 Book of Mormon that uh, all of a sudden I realized there were changes in the Book of Mormon and that just kind of blew me away that I thought the Book of Mormon was word for word. And to realize there were changes and I'd never heard that before. So then started realizing and looking at the first vision accounts and uh, other things that just kind of made me sus suspect that maybe Joseph Smith really didn't have that 1820 experience. And that just, and then Carl and I started reading the Bible, you know, and that's the worst thing you can do. <laughs> no, that's true. Start realizing that, that there's scriptures there that I'd never, never read before. Yeah. So anyway, it's, it has been joyful and less judgment, less pride. Oh, true. And, yes. uh, and just so grateful for what Jesus did for me. And I know you'd feel the yeah. same way that we couldn't do for ourselves. It's not about us. It's about him. Yeah. And yeah. I think it's important that we had the Mormon experience. Yeah, I guess to appreciate. Yes, where, where we, to we appreciate the truth. And where others are going through. Exactly. Yeah. I, I'm, I, I'm grateful for it. Yeah, well, Danny's involved in a number of different projects, and one of them is a phone call-in program that you, well, program, but a, a thing Talking you do, talkingtomormons.com. I think we're going to put your name and phone number <laughs> up there. And But one of the things that I, tell us about that. How did that get started and what's, uh, what's involved with that? Well, um, what happened was I had a hotline for years, right? It's, it was my, it's my own personal phone number. And oh. so when people call me, um, they have questions about Mormonism. It's interesting because there's different groups of people that call me. Uh, there are those who are interested in Mormonism, and so they were taking the discussions. So they're Christians or something? They may be Christians, and they're, they're, they're investigating the church. They're meeting with the missionaries. Uh, the first time they, they meet with the missionaries, they have they go online and following that. Oh, and they look up Mormonism. Yeah, and they, cut, they see my talking to Mormons and, uh, and give you a website. Call. And so then they call me thinking maybe they can get some answers to some of the questions that the missionaries wouldn't answer or couldn't answer. And then I just teach them how to interact with the missionaries and sort of what they're going to get themselves yeah. into a little bit. I don't discourage them from not talking to the elders or the sisters. I think it's really important that they find out uh, what they teach and then be prepared to know that the Bible may teach something different. Yeah. And then I have groups of people who have left Mormonism, but they have family that are still members. That are still members. Now, yeah. how the, do they interact with them? Some of them have already burned bridges and offended their family. And they're just desperate yeah. to know how do I how do I breach that again? Right. You know how do I overcome that and get back to having a relationship with them? So I try to help them walk them through those steps of, you know, explaining to them that they don't have to, you know, turn on the fire hose anymore. Right. You know, just, just be patient, be so patient, loving. Let God kind of do the work. <laughs> God, it's all it's all God's work, isn't it? Yeah. So um, do you ever get phone calls from people whose children? Oh yes, I've gone. Oh yeah, I've met with the missionaries. Now the Christian parents are concerned yeah. of what. It, yeah, I get husbands that say my wife's meeting with the missionaries, and I don't want them here. What do I do? Oh, you know. So I mean, there's just lots of different. I have Christians who call me out of, out of the blue, really, and I'm talking to people around the world, right, who say, um, I have a heart for for the LDS. I've never met a Mormon. I don't know anything about them. Isn't that the strangest thing? I mean, even the people yes. that help us with this program have never been Mormon. Right. I mean, so to have a heart and a love for that, and people even come in to Salt Lake to 
God is working to, in, to, yeah. powerfully in people's lives to uh, use them like you're talking they about. just have this heart for Mormons yes, and yeah. love. It's all about love. And we do too. You know, the reason we do the program, the reason you and I are here and, and it is because we do care about Mormons. Definitely. And, yeah. yeah. One of the things that I wanted to kind of come out of this part of the conversation was uh, defining terms. Sure. And as you meet with people on the phone and so on, how do, how do you talk about that issue? Well, one of the things that I, I, I realize is that um, the problem with the communication between family members or friends is that they're not talking about the, they're talking about a subject or a term, but they're past, they're talking past each other and they're yeah. not really on the same page. So when they're talking about something like grace or salvation or same e words, even Jesus, they, you know, and yeah. defining Jesus. So I always encourage them, first of all, Define the terms that you're talking about yeah. so that, uh, and I think it's really important that you've got a Bible nearby, if you can, <laughs> to open it up, know your scriptures, and show them where they can find it. Because when you, they get done talking to their friend, they're, you don't want to give the impression that it's just your opinion that you're sharing with them, but right. it it's, comes from the Word of God. Mm -hmm. And they can go to the Word of God yeah. and find the same information there. So. Well, one thing that I know with, with Mormons, uh, with LDS, and I guess, sorry about using the term Mormons anymore. Isn't that funny? All I of know, a sudden, now you're feeling guilty about Mor it. <laughs> Mormons are uh, Mormons and anathema to the Mormons. Uh, that's strange. But is, is the idea of salvation, exaltation, uh, everlasting life, eternal life, being mm -hmm. saved. Yeah. Um, don't Mormons, LDS, think that being saved is just being resurrected? Is that true? I think they believe that Jesus paid for their sins and right. that he saved them from their sins. And but that every, all men will be resurrected. But that all men will be resurrected. That's the only gift we get from. That's true. Right. The gift we get from Jesus is, is resurrection. Yeah. And then everything after that we work for. We work for and then the atonement fills in the, the gap. At the very end. Jesus yeah. does the little bit that we can't do. Right. Hmm. So you do try to define terms and make sure that people understand yeah, that. That's important, I yeah. think, yeah, okay. as a guideline. We are going to have to go to our notes quite a bit because we did a lot of work and study on this, so apologize for any of you. One thing I think we have already covered, and that is the value of reading the Bible. And I just think that if, if any encouragement, and, and no Mormon LDS should be afraid to go research the Bible. And yet I know that if you walked in and to a meeting and said, hey, we're going to read from the Bible today, you know, it would be almost like, well, okay. And yet this... How about reading the Book of Mormon? And know? yet this year, you know, is there in the Come Follow Me program for right. the church, their study is the New Testament. So they encourage people to read the New Testament. Yeah. Well, uh, no, I, I, yeah. I realize that. It's just to study the New Testament yeah. would be, I mean, they spend, well, we'll get into, uh, yes. we're going to get yeah. into that one later. Um, okay. Well, let's just jump in. We've got a whole raft of topics, and uh, and we're going to and you're going to start actually with God was once a man. Yeah. Is that right? Well, no, he wasn't. But <laughs> yes, that's a topic. Go uh, God was once a man. Uh, that all kind of started out in in Mormonism uh, with a couplet that was written by Lorenzo Snow. Lorenzo Snow was an early convert in Mormonism who eventually become, became a president of the church, right. you know, the, the leading prophet of, for the church. But he put together this couplet that says, As man now is, God once was. As God now is, man may be. And so Joseph Smith, I think, took that idea and ran with it. We find that um, he gave a, a sermon at a funeral it's called the King Follett Sermon. Yeah. And there he quote, I'll quote this. Um, he says, Here then is eternal life to know the only wise and true God, and you have got to learn how to be gods yourselves, and to be kings and priests to God, the same as all gods have done before you by going from one small degree to another, and from one small capacity to a great one, from grace to grace, from exaltation to exaltation, until you attain to the resurrection of the dead and are able to dwell in everlasting burnings and to sit in glory as do those who sit enthroned in everlasting power. So that's really the object of our being here on earth is to make 
to to progress towards Godhood. Yeah. Joseph Smith said eventually said. if you, you were able to become gods and it have all the power of God one day. And if you were a Christian, a good Bible believing reading Christian, what would you think of that when you heard it? Yeah, well, I have two I, if you go to Isaiah particularly, it's full of verses that where God is speaking about himself. Right. And the two verses that I like to to refer to is in Isaiah, the first one is Isaiah 43:10. Before me there was no God formed, neither, uh, neither shall there be after me. Okay, And then Isaiah, just over in the next chapter, Isaiah 44, verses 6 and 8, I am the first and I am the last, and beside me there is no God. Is there a God beside me? Yea, there is no God. I know not any. So God says there's no God beside me. <laughs> There's no God that I even know of. Yeah. I don't even know in Mormonism, God wouldn't even know about his God or his Father in heaven, right? So, but the Bible teaches clearly that there is only one true and living God. He's the only one in it that's ever, there ever has been and that no person can ever attain yeah. Godhood. Did you, ever, did you ever sense as a Mormon that this concept actually focuses more on the person, on us, than on God. I mean, I, I never, I just accepted the fact that there were many gods and that I was one day going to become one. And getting married in the temple, of course, and celestial mm -hmm. kingdom and all that stuff, and that I would become a god. Yeah. But it, it actually minimizes the god that we worship oh, now. Definitely. Because he's just one of many. I, I always worried that how can I trust a person, a God that was once a person who was a sinner like me? Yeah. Who eventually, I guess, over See, and I never even thought of got that. to a point where he was so righteous in his mortal life that he was able to qualify for exaltation and Godhood. And then would there ever be a ch chance that he would not, you know, be worthy himself to answer my prayer or to... to um, yeah. To do all the things that, you know, he's, God's supposed, that God's to, be supposed to do. Yeah, I, I the, wondered about that. The one thing that I thought, and, and we'll come, maybe end with this unless you've got another yeah. thought, but I just kept thinking, um, as a Mormon, I kept thinking, well, what is that little moment like? Is it when I graduate or when yeah, I cross that, the stage? <laughs> I mean, when does that little switch flip? Yes, yeah. Yeah, when do I become a God? I mean, yeah. am I pretty good up until that little last moment and then I finally get it? I know. Yeah, and, and now to worship the one God is, is just... The one thing I want to say about yeah. the Christian point of view of God is that when He created us as creatures, uh, His hope was that we would eventually accept His Son as our Savior, and by doing so, we would become a child of God, and yeah. that we would become sons and daughters of God, and, uh, and that's what we would be given a new heart, and that we would serve Him and love others, mm -hmm. and that in that process that we would become joint heirs with God yeah. to inherit heaven with Him, but never to be equal to Him. <laughs> <laughs> Such a strange concept. Yeah. Well, my number, my first one here is Joseph Smith's boast, and that's how I started the program, and I'll just read the, the boast. I, I know this impacted Carla when she first heard it. I'd heard it before, read it, but it never really struck me what it was really saying. I have more to boast of than in, any man ever had. I am the only man that has ever been able to keep a whole church together since the days of Adam. A large majority of the whole have stood by me. Neither Paul, John, Peter, nor Jesus ever did it. I boast that no man, and I think that includes Jesus, ever did such a work as I. The followers of Jesus ran away from him, but the Latter-day Saints never ran away from me yet. Yeah. There's such arrogance in that statement. Yeah. I, I know they were bold in their comments oftentimes. Well, you know, we put him on a high pedestal, Joseph, Joseph Smith. Smith so absolutely. Never offended me when I was a Mormon. No. We could sing praises to him, praise yeah. to the man, and that never really offended me. Yeah, me But either. now I, it does offend me. The only person I want to praise is God. Isn't that a Who isn't a man. <laughs> I love that new creature aspect that we both share to see things so differently. And yeah, and yeah it's, yeah. Anyway, go okay, ahead. Okay, the next second. topic is the word of wisdom. Oh. Yeah, that's always an interesting Let's topic. Have a hot to talk drink. About. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so Fair during enough. the temp, during the eight, early 1800s, there was a temperance movement that was in, in play uh, in the United States. So, 
Um, I think that Joseph Smith was probably inspired a little bit by that or by the people around him that wanted him to do something about the drinking and the smoking and all that stuff that was going on. Mm -hmm. So uh, according to history, church history, Emma sort of prompted him to, or I pushed him to have a revelation. Found all this tobacco on the floor. Yeah, <laughs> the spittle that he wanted, they, she got tired of cleaning up after their meetings. Right. Uh, section 89 is a revelation that Joseph Smith claims he had that gives some counsel about, you know, what people should eat and drink. And right. so we find that in the second verse of section 89 in the Doctrine and Covenants, it says, to be sent greeting not by commandment or constraint, <laughs> but by revelation and the word of God, showing forth the order and will of God in the temporal salvation of all saints in the last days. Okay, so it was by revelation, but it wasn't a commandment, it wasn't right. by constraint. So right. it seems like it was a pretty open, right. you know, make your own decision, be wise about it, use wisdom in doing it. But the things that it lists in section 89 that they should avoid are hot drinks, for one thing, right. which would include what hot drinks? Well, tea and coffee was what was defined, I guess, right? Yeah, not in the Revelation, no, but, but just they hot interpreted drinks. it to hot be, drinks, yeah. yeah. Soups. So who knows? Soups, hot right? Chocolate. Hot soups, hot chocolate, yeah. uh, alcohol and tobacco. Um, it says in verse 7, strong drinks and liquor are for the washing of the body. Um, tobacco is an herb for bruises and all sick cattle. I don't ever remember. I've worked around a lot of cattle. I don't ever remember using tobacco to, to oh, cure anything. I, I don't <laughs> uh, know that. I should look it in up. Ver, in verse 12 and 13, it talks about eating meat sparingly and only in times oh. of famine and in cold and in winter. And uh, I, don't I know that doesn't apply today because <laughs> Mormons are big eat meat eaters. Yeah. And that uh, verse 17, barley is for good for mild drinks. Well, what is barley? Beer. Beer. Yeah, I heard that one yeah, recently, that yeah. barley's actually... <laughs> yeah, well actually, Brigham Young had one of the biggest distilleries west of the Mississippi here, located in Salt Lake City, so yeah. um, anyway. Of course, it, at that point it wasn't a commandment, it was only a, a word of wisdom. Exactly, right? but it, it, then, it, it then kind of mushroomed, yeah, as, yeah. as different prophets took, took a lead of the church, they decided they even got so strict as to say that even cola drinks were banned for a while. Oh, the caffeine. Yeah, some yeah. bishops were saying you can't have a temple recommend if you're drinking, you know, caffeinated pot, uh, soda. And uh, and you remember the group we met at the symposium, that they don't yeah. eat chocolate yeah. <laughs> because it has the, caffeine. The fundamentalist group. Yeah. Um, however, with all the changes that are going on in the church, there was speculation that possibly the word of wisdom might be modified. Mm. Uh, you know, so maybe coffee and tea would be acceptable. Um, but there was a New Era article in August of 2019 that really doubled down on the on the word, on of, the wisdom. word of wisdom. It was called vaping coffee, tea, and marijuana. Oh yeah. And so they expanded on it and talked a lot about it. My question is, if you're going to do any changes or interpretations of, with that revelation that Joseph Smith received, it seems to me like it would take another revelation. Yeah, you would think to change so. what the doctrine yeah. or the teachings were in that initial one, but I haven't seen it yet. Rather than a poll or a survey or something. Yeah, and here's the here, here's the real the real uh, sort of warning. It comes from the Gospel Principle Manual. It says, "quote We must obey the word of wisdom to be worthy to enter the temple. If we do not obey the word of wisdom, the Lord's Spirit withdraws from us." End quote. <laughs> so it could prevent us from getting to the celestial kingdom. <laughs> In Christianity, there's no prohibitions on what we put into our bodies. No. It, God said, Jesus said, it's not what a man... Um, goes into the mouth. Yeah, it goes into the mouth, but what comes out of the mouth that defiles a man. So I actually like the fact in Christianity that you're actually responsible for yourself. Yeah. You know, you're a, you don't overdo. You know, you use wisdom and... So moderation. Uh, yeah, and I don't think uh, the rules are... Uh, yeah. Anyway, yeah. Yes. Enjoy that better. So really, no state president or bishop should be a judge over you as to what you should eat to tell you whether you're worthy or not. Yeah. You know, that even, should be left even up Jesus, to us. We should follow the spirit that should be bibber. left up to us. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, the next one we have and, um, is uh, temples. Now, I, I thought about this quite a bit, and I, I'll just jump to the couple of quotes that I have. President Nelson said, Obedience to temple covenants qualifies us for eternal life. Eternal life comes from obedience to temple ordinances. That's in the church news back in 2001. 
And yet in John 6, 47, it says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me hath everlasting life. And in John 17, 3, and we all know this, and this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. And then Marky Peterson also had a good one on restoration, on, uh, on the temple. In biblical times, sacred ordinances were administered in holy edifices for the spiritual salvation of ancient Israel. Following the pattern of biblical days, the Lord again in our day has provided these ordinances for all who will believe in his book, Why Build Temples, page 3. But my question is, is what exactly was restored in the temple? <laughs> because the, there was only one temple at a time. That's right. Yeah. And they did animal sacrifices. And uh, did this strike you yeah, too? Yeah, when I went to Israel and I realized that the, the temple in Jerusalem was the only temple they had, they had really built on that site. Um, it wasn't like they had temples all over no, the place. No, yeah. and that one temple was to represent the one and true living God. And so to have mm -hmm. multiple hundreds of temples like the LDS do would, would probably mean that they believe in the plurality of gods. Oh, that's Whereas a good point. there's just only one good temple. Point. And yeah, God said there's no t temple you know, made with hands, that he yeah, exists. That, that he, he doesn't dwell in that's temples. That's right. You know, it even says that in the Book of Mormon. I know. Yeah, it does. The other thing that struck me about that is that Jesus couldn't go into the temple because he wasn't from the tribe of Levi. Peter and Paul, none of the apostles could go into the temple no. because they, they could go into the outer cor courtyard. They could go into the never, courtyard. Yeah. And that, when we read that in the Bible or anywhere that they went to the temple, temple to teach. they really went to the outer court. That's it. They couldn't go into the temple because only Levi priests. Women could not go into the temple. So what was the restoration? Good question. Oops. <laughs> anyway, you know what? We're actually running out of time. Running out of time for this one. <laughs> well, we won't have as much introduction next time. But anyway, Danny, I sure appreciate you coming and, you. and sharing. We'll, we'll do another episode here and continue on with these topics. We'll see you next time on the Ex-Mormon Files. Mm -hmm.